so hi everyone, welcome and uh, thanks for coming to the OT portion of the conference. Uh, my name is Kim Anderson and I work at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia in the Neuromuscular Clinic. And today we'll be talking about occupational therapy best practices within the pediatric non-sitter uh, population. I've been asked to have everyone direct their questions to the Whova app in the question and answer box if possible. Uh, so just an overview, today we'll be reviewing the standards of care recommendations, uh, and then also reviewing three case presentations within an infant, a child, adolescent, uh, and adult patient. Uh, the primary rehab goal within the standards of care is to optimize function and minimize impairment, and within the non-sitter population, uh, these are the modalities listed below, which we will uh, review uh, through the presentation. Uh, the standards of care identify the signs and symptoms of a non-sitter as having severe progression of muscle weakness. Um, but if you were listening to the um, talks before, that has started to change with uh, earlier detection with BERT screens uh, and new uh, disease-specific drug treatments that are being administered. Uh, in the clinic setting, as an OT, when I go in uh, to evaluate a patient who is a non-sitter, my main goal is to get a lot of information from a patient caregiver interview. Um, I'm assessing uh, the current level of their participation in their daily activities, uh, play, leisure, IADLs, and then also working with the, the patient and family uh, to determine what therapy goals they do have. The reason we do that is to more specifically um, look at different areas of the upper extremity, uh, to look more specifically at their range of motion and strength uh, to best determine what intervention should be used. Um, typically, if a patient is also identified um, wanting to interact with their uh, environment or um, have community mobility and they are uh, of the weaker, patient, then we also do a vision screen. Uh, we're asking about if the patient has an iPad or like device, um, are they able to choose between two pictures? Can they sustain their gaze uh, for a choice selection? Are they able to track? Uh, those kinds of things uh, for eye gaze system specific things. Um, within this population, there is a lack of SMA specific out, upper extremity outcome measures. Um, that being said, uh, newly um, presented to us is the adult test of neuromuscular disorders, which does include the um, strength measures of uh, the cervical, shoulder, and elbow, and distal upper extremity strength. You can see on the side here, uh, the things that are focused on in the evaluations from importance to less important. Uh, with occupational therapy, we are focusing more on strength measures and how uh, it is affecting their uh, ability to uh, perform their daily activities. Uh, within the standards of care, these are the uh, interventions listed on the side here with the arrow. Again, um, from what was discussed earlier today, the order of these items um, I'm thinking will start to shift. Uh, as our patients have the potential to become stronger. Uh, for, those of, for those patients who are identified to have um, passive range limitations or muscle contractures that are keeping them from attaining their goals, uh, we provide a stretching program for. With these patients, uh, we want to provide a low load uh, prolonged stretch and we want them performing these stretches a minimum of three to five times a week. On the right side here, I have some pictures of typical splints that we have for patients that have muscle contractures. We have a resting hand splint, uh, an elbow extension splint, and these orthotics are typically, um, typically advised to wear uh, for overnight and on a daily basis. Here we have um, positioning and bracing, which is extremely important for this population. Uh, their muscle weakness, uh, keeps them from engaging in their environment. So these uh, medical equipment devices are able to help them engage. Uh, for sake of time, I'll have you look through those yourself here and we will speak to some of them uh, in the case studies later. 
So here we have a video of one of the interventions of mobility and exercise, which again is starting to become more important for this population. Uh, the slings and springs is an overhead suspension system. You can see our little friend here is in her car seat. The suspension is from the handle uh, using TheraBand and soft straps to get her in a uh, gravity eliminated position suspended. And you can see uh, to engage with the toy, she's activating elbow flexion extension and sh some uh, shoulder internal and external rotation. And there's some repetition of movement here too. Uh, I don't have the, the video of, the, of her in supine, um, but she really is limited in her movement in that position. And over here to the right, I have uh, some pictures of how this can be recreated either um, in your outpatient setting or at home. A lot of our patient families will use a play gym. Uh, some of our more handy families uh, were able to recreate this PVC frame um, for, to, to hang the slings from. Uh, and also we have been told that uh, the uh, height changing um, Drying rack is also a great resource uh, for some of our older patients. Uh, another great modality for this population is aquatic therapy. It's one of my favorite as I do take a lot of our patients down to the pool here. Um, our patients are, are, uh, do have um, a lot significant muscle weakness. Um, so they're constantly fighting gravity. Uh, the properties of the water are able to help support and resist movement depending on what position the patient is in. Uh, the properties are also able to provide proprioceptive input, which can help with body awareness. Uh, it's able to limit compensatory movements that the patients might rely on on land. Uh, and it's also a great motivator within a supportive environment for play. Uh, and here on the right is just a list of what the research uh, is currently saying about aquatic therapy. And as always, more uh, research is needed. Uh, here, let's just get right to some videos. Uh, this is my friend Shane, he has SMA2. He's a little bit weaker. Uh, he's not sitting by himself on land. He lost that skill. Um, let's try to get this video started here. Here we go. So you can see I'm working on transitional movements with him. The buoyancy is helping him uh, to grade his muscle activation and how he's slowly lowering his head back here into cervical extension to move into supine. He's semi-relaxing, he's got a little bit of shoulder elevation, gets a little nervous with his ears in the water, but then I'm just giving him a gentle rocking motion to get the buoyancy, helping him good to bring him up into a chin tuck position, something he's not able to do on land, but something we're able to easily repeat uh, for um, an exercise to help strengthen those muscles. This next video, uh, he is moving from upright into prone. And you can see he hates being in the pool with that smile on his face. Um, but typically when he, I'll play it again, when he first goes into the position, he goes into almost like an extreme cervical extension to help hold the position. But as we're moving him forward and giving him a little bit more dynamic movement, he's able to grade the force to come a little bit more into midline. Uh, and also at the same time, he's using dynamic movement of his upper body against the resistance of the water. Uh, you can see he has a nice open hand posture here too at the end, uh, which even provides more resistance to, um, to the upper extremity movement. And this last video here, Shane is working on his postural stability. You can see he's in a straddle sit position using both of his arms moving back and forth. Um, I don't know if it's too far away to tell, but you can see he changes his position of his forearm. He almost automatically can tell that with uh, his forearm in neutral, it gives more resistance to the movement and he kind of quickly switches back uh, and throws the rings, but then can able, is easily able to reach forward uh, and grab the ring, something that's not, he's not able to do on land. Here he is about six months later. Uh, he's able to reach up off the surface of the water uh, against gravity using the vertical surface of the mirror in front. You can see he's getting some nice shoulder flexion here, sustained uh, to work with these uh, toys on the mirror surface. And the other picture we have here, Shane worked hard uh, to get into this uh, semi-weight bearing position and prone with uh, upper, upper extremity extension. 
Uh, so once we got into this position, he loves to go around on the surface of the pool with some dynamic movement uh, to help strengthen his shoulder stability. Uh, and you can see how surprised he is at all the progress he's making in the pool. Uh, another great intervention that we use uh, for some of our weaker patients are some technological adaptations. Uh, we use switches to help our patients um, engage in their environment, uh, engage with toys. So things such as the biofeedback and biometric systems are able to detect small movements. And the pictures on the right here um, are the surface EMG that goes along with the biometrics um, and the micro light switch. Uh, all of these switches, depending on the patient's abilities, uh, can be used to access uh, their environment, play with computer games, uh, interact with toys, uh, and can end up also being a mobility and exercise modality, uh, depending on their strength. Um, and then again, as I mentioned in the evaluation part, uh, we are looking at if the, if the patient has a potential to use the IV system. Uh, if they are deemed that way, then we send them for an assessment uh, with our, our outpatient speech therapist. We'll start with our case study here. Rakan is a 13 month old male. Uh, he started showing symptoms at two weeks old. He was showing signs of hypotonia, tongue fasciculations, and was also turning blue with feeds. Uh, his highest motor function achieved uh, was sitting with men assistance. He's rolling into right and left sideline and also reaching in supine and sit. Uh, he has a family history of SMA, and he was treated with gene therapy at four months old. Uh, medically, he has a G-tube. He got a G-tube at seven months, excuse me, um, and still requires BiPAP at night. So here's just an overview of all the information that we were able to get from his evaluation. I've highlighted a few things here. Um, one, these are the things that we're going to use uh, in relation to the parent goals. Uh, so his head control is unable to clear his, his airway and prone. He's not yet rolling. Uh, he's able to lift his arms up off the mat and supine. He's trunk walking, so using his fingers against his trunk to help bring his hand to his mouth. He has a weak grasp. Um, and then just to overview, the, the parent goals are for the patient to be able to crawl and walk. Um, so let's move on here. So our treatment plan for him is to um, promote rolling supine to prone uh, to help with bed mobility. We want him bringing his hands to his mouth for um, more independence with self-feeding once it's appropriate. Uh, we want him demonstrating better cervical extension for, for play exploration, especially in prone. Um, and we also want him demonstrating uh, more of a reach uh, to assist with upper body dressing. And the plan for him was he uh, was involved in our intensive uh, rehab program. So he was able to get OT, PT, and speech over a three month period uh, for, I believe, 60 to 90 minutes a day. So for uh, Rakan, the durable medical equipment that he required, uh, he used a stroller to get around here at the hospital and within his uh, community. We also use the slings and springs for him. Uh, for postural support, we would use an activity chair or tumble form chair if we were looking more at upper extremity movement solely. Uh, and we also use this field vest as a way of active assist uh, for um, trunk writing. Uh, for ADLs, we use a neck ring for more independence with bathing and also for uh, modified aquatic therapy sessions, as you'll see in some videos upcoming here. So here he is using the slings and springs. You can see he's in a sideline position. Um, there is a sling up here approximately, holding his shoulder in a little bit of a abduction to um, allow for movement. I'll just push play here. You can see this more distal uh, sling is, has a line of pull coming from the uh, bottom of the crib that's able to provide some resistance to uh, elbow flexion to get a little bit of strengthening there with the bicep. And as actually he's holding the toy out, there's a little bit of elbow extension that's happening there too, which is important because a lot of our patients have um, more significant tricep weakness. Further through his therapy, you can see here he is in supine. And 
We're gonna see him reach up. He's able to lift his whole arm off of the mat. Not so great at grading the force and coming back down. Um, again, he's reaching and he's showing us a stronger grasp to hold on to that ring uh, that the therapist is giving some resistance to. Here is our modified aquatic therapy sessions. Unfortunately, due to COVID, we were unable to bring uh, Rakan down to the pool. So we brought the pool therapy to him. Um, here he is using a neck ring in his rehab room bathtub. Uh, the therapist was able to, let me try to get this video started here. Uh, so the therapist was working on rolling with him. So you can see he's giving the rotation at the hips. Facilitating, or Khan's able to use his own trunk muscles and some of his cervical rotation uh, to assist with achieving prone position. You see he's working hard here to get the momentum. He's able to bring himself back up into supine. Um, so more repetition with this activity is gonna help him uh, complete these activities on land. Um, intervention on land. Uh, our therapist is using a dynamic surface of a large therapy ball, which allows for ease of position change, um, which helps with grading the different levels of how much uh, gravity assistance is needed, and also just for ease of handling. So here, it's getting some of that same motion with hip rotation. It's got some gravity assistance with, with uh, trunk rotation, moving that right arm across midline, the therapist is helping him prop on his forearms. You can see he's got a gentle rocking back motion that's gonna help Rakan achieve cervical extension, gravity assisted. He's able to hold it for a little bit here, sustained and then loses it. So the therapist rocks the ball back more for gravity assistance to regain it. You can see upgrades, tries to upgrade the activity and bring him back and Rakan's just too tired to keep it set up for continuing that activity. Uh, here we have a, a transitional movement where the therapist is attempting to facilitate uh, supine to sit. So that same chin tuck that we were seeing with, chain, with Shane in the pool, excuse me, um, we're trying on the ball here with Rakan. So the therapist has a pretty high support here. Rakan does a little bit to help with getting up into the upright position. He's holding it, holding it, but that dynamic surface is just a little too much for him and he loses control anteriorly. The therapist then gives him a little bit of a bounce, a little bit of movement to start initiating. Coming back up into upright, you can see he's using his upper extremities just ever so slightly on his upper thigh to help bring him back up into that upright position. And last but not least, we have um, Rakan again on the ball in supine. I'll start the video, here we go. Um, so the therapist just ever so slightly rocks the ball a little to the left, which helps initiate that uh, trunk rotation uh, to, and also bringing the arm slightly internally rotated with shoulder flexion. And you can see he's able to sustain his grasp on the toy, uh, moving his arm and flexion extension. Uh, that sustained movement is really gonna help strengthen that shoulder girdle to help us achieve the goal of um, reaching for dressing. Okay, our second case study, I have Caleb is a seven-year-old male with SMA1. He um, started experiencing symptoms at three weeks old. His highest motor function achieved was to accept a dependent semi-upright position for greater than 30 minutes. He shows digit and wrist movement and is also uh, showing consistent eyebrow and lip twitch. His medical history includes a G-tube at three months. He was trached at six. He also uh, got his first dose of Spinraza at three years, um, eight months. So you can imagine uh, how much his muscle weakness had already progressed by that point. Um, so his, and his therapy and exercise program included intermittent outpatient OT and PT. Uh, due to all of his medical needs, he required medical transport to get here. So that made it a, a little bit challenging uh, for ongoing outpatient therapy. Uh, it's also complicated by all of his medical stays for um, multiple times uh, inpatient for um, pulmonary infections. 
So uh, in his evaluation, what we were able to find uh, was some right and left index finger and thumb movement, uh, some wrist movement, flexion, extension, and deviation, uh, and also some eyebrow and lip twitching in imitating the therapist's facial expressions. Uh, the parents identified in the evaluation that they wanted to Im improve his ability to communicate and play. So his treatment plans and goals included um, first sending him uh, to the facial motion clinic here so we can really hone in on uh, what muscle strength he had within his face muscles. Uh, he was also sent to uh, OT, a combined OT and speech um, assistive tech and communication device evaluation. Uh, just because he's so complex, we wanted to make sure that we were specifically looking at the right things um, to have him access his environment. Um, so here we have that exact active movement, the right and left thumb or index finger movement over 10, 10 consecutive opportunities to activate the switch and same with the eyebrow movement, 10 consecutive uh, opportunities and then being able to de decide between the two uh, which one he was more consistent with and then sticking with that to activate different toys. Uh, we. Uh, due to his contractures uh, and passive range limitations, he was provided with a stretching program for elbow extension and uh, PIP extension. He did have some contracture that uh, his PIPs and in both hands. Uh, he was also given uh, custom bilateral resting hand splints that he was able to use overnight and tolerated pretty well. Here's a long list of all of his uh, durable medical equipment that he uses in the picture here. He's in his standard with his tray, which was pretty typical of the position that we used um, for switch activation, which you can see in this next slide. Uh, so here's Caleb. We're using the biofeedback electrodes to determine if the, uh, how strong um, his eyebrow twitch is. So I don't know if you can hear the sound here, but the therapist is making growling noises and growling, making growling faces to have Caleb imitate. And you can see we're able to detect uh, how much movement he has there. So hey, then the idea for treatment would be to introduce this to him over a certain amount of time and then see if his strength levels um, improve over time uh, or, if he, or even if he's uh, consistent with movement at all here. Uh, secondly, we wanted to work with the active movement that we were seeing between the index finger and the thumb. Uh, first, all the way over to the right with the right and left hand, we were using a Fabrifoam strap with uh, Velcro and the Microlite switch. Um, I think there was just too much movement when he was trying to activate the switch uh, with uh, the strap. So that didn't work out too well. And then we have him uh, propped on our highly technical device of a um, roll of tape here. And even in that situation, it ended up being that the, the switch was just a little too hard for him uh, to activate. So luckily the OT he was working with is one of our um, assistive tech gurus and also apparently MacGyver. He was able to uh, make a switch here out of a file folder uh, and some other materials that I'll show you um, in an upcoming slide here to really have um, even the lightest of touch uh, have him activate a uh, toy. I'll show you a video here. Hi, Kim. Um, we're a little yes. bit over, so um, um, just take another minute or so. to. So okay, perfect. This Great. is the last video. I'm sorry. Thank perfect. you. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so here's Caleb sitting in his activity chair, engaging in a fishing game with his nurse and father. There's only one fish left that I don't believe he can see. Let's see if I can progress this along. So he stops when the game is over. And then as the nurse and father start to try to put the fish back in, Caleb likes to play a game where he keeps it moving to make it a little bit more challenging for them. And we were able to see some, some consistency with that over time. So then the switch was sent home with the family to then uh, try to adapt to other toys uh, before coming back for more therapy to see uh, if we can use that switch for other avenues. Okay, it was just a how to make your own switch. I'm sorry, I went over time. Some good community resources. Thank you to the patients and families. 
uh, and we'll go over questions at the end of Julie's presentation. Okay. And if you do have any questions, feel free to um, put it in the Q&A portion of the Whova app, please. Thank you. So I'll stop sharing here. And I'm going to get mine. Is it coming up? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Kim. That was a fantastic presentation. Um, I will try and condense a full day's worth of Sorry. information into 10 minutes. <laughs> Uh, so my name is Julie Muccini. I'm the occupational therapist here at Stanford Healthcare. I work in the outpatient neuro rehab clinic, as well as I'm the sole primary OT in the neuromuscular clinic. I'm very fortunate to work with Dr. Day uh, on a regular basis. I have no financial disclosures, no financial relationships with any of the vendors or the products discussed in this presentation, and there will be many. Again, uh, just in review, the, uh, I work with the adult population only, so 21 and over. And um, when I meet my uh, amazing patients, they are already uh, extremely contracted in their elbows and joints and have some wonderful facial movement and a, a very slight active range of motion in their thumb and finger flexors. So, uh, at, you know, I review their abilities for ADLs, which is primarily dependent, IADLs dependent, uh, apart from working, um, range of motion, this will be covered, some splinting and the the wonderful and complex area of durable medical equipment and the complex rehab technology. I'm also the therapist who runs the wheelchair program here. So I do all the power wheelchairs in use of alternate controls. Uh, so I, when I meet my wonderful patients, they are uh, generally dependent for all meal preparation, dependent feeding and dressing and bathing. Uh, they are power wheelchair dependent and they all use alternate controls. Um, my patients are incredibly smart, super duper smart people doing amazing things as adults. And so they are employed and they use their computers for access. So the evaluations, um, again, assessing passive range of motion, active range of motion, but, but like I said, they are quite contracted and their ability to access their environment. Uh, I am very fortunate to work with Sally Dunaway. So she does the majority of the outcome measures. Um, and so, but if you don't have a colleague as do I, you could do the revised upper limb module, but I just dive right into the abilities of my patients and I review all their durable medical equipment and all their custom rehab technology. Um, I won't go into reading everything, but also caregiver skills for transfer. Most of my patients arrive, they arrive with hired caregivers. Their parents are no longer providing care. They're, these are independent individuals. Um, and so there's you know, a range of caregivers that come through their life. And so that's part of our role is to facilitate their working together as a team. Um, the goal is promoting range of motion, strength with their fingers, uh, again, maintaining that beautiful motion and strength in their mouth, which ends up being a lot of their ability to control their alternate controls and um, accessing technology, um, writing prescriptions. So I'll write the prescriptions and our doc my doctors and nurse practitioners will just co-sign and then we send those all off to vendors and of course, ergonomic assessments and work accommodations. Um, the, the DME recommendations, um, I do have some patients who, who do use mobile arm supports. And uh, there, so I've listed some of the products here. And like I said, there's a, not a lot of time and a lot to discuss. So I will just say that these are some names to follow up with. Neater arms are from the UK. Uh, I have a lot of experience with the Canova robotic arm, which I'll show briefly touch upon later. Uh, I gave a presentation at CureMSA Summit of Strength in 2019, and I did uh, cover the robotic arm, which I've written letters of um, medical necessity for some of my patients to have these added to their chairs. Uh, you know, a, a robotic arm is facilitating meaningful, purposeful, uh, functional occupation, activities of daily living, school-based, occupation-based. Um, here's, uh, he's a, um, 
Zach is taking a photograph. He's not a non-sitter, but he's here. Um, uh, Owen is a non-sitter and uh, this is purpose. You're using your, your tool to smell the roses. Everyone has deserves that ability to have that independent opportunity to smell roses. And so, you know, you have to think about later in life, these times, types of tools are really help our patients access their environment and their community. Um, as Kim uh, beautifully mentioned, uh, splinting and positioning is critical. Uh, like I said, my patients arrive there um, they are already contracted severely. And so, you know, we try to facilitate um, uh, that maintenance of the range of motion they have. And so whether they're custom thermoplast or, or off the shelf, there are some really nice, very soft, adjustable. Most of my adults don't like to wear their splints as they're adults. And so I really try and encourage them to, but uh, it, it's kind of a, a a back and forth discussion. There are low load dynamic tension adjustable splints, but the tension has to be dialed way down and Dyna splint uh, and custom certified hand therapists can make some of those. And of course, always working on positioning to reduce that risk of pressure ulcers. Everyone needs sleep. So a lot of my time is spent talking with my patients about the beds. And I have to say for all the uh, pediatric OTs, if you could be sure that before your patient transitioned to the adult side, that they have the very best power wheelchair, the very best alternate controls, the very best um, uh, beds, lateral rotation mattresses, because when they transition to the adult side, it is a totally different ball game trying to have insurance cover anything. And so I really try and encourage um, my social worker who works on the pediatric side to remind parents and therapists to get everything possible right before their 21st birthday. Um, and so, you know, we work on the hill run progressive lateral rotation. Uh, pro bed is also called freedom bed and that has a lateral rotation component, which some of my patients really enjoy. There's some other rhythm um, rhythm turn lateral rotation mattresses out there. Um, if they are sleeping, if they don't want to go that route and they're in the like an automatic uh, automatic adjustable bed from a sleep store, uh, you know, a sleep number is very comfortable. My patients have severe scoliosis, severely contracted, and you can dial the sleep number to really contour to their, uh, you know, to their curvatures and um, to their bodies. And then um, inflatable wedges is low uh, tech where it's a mattress genie and that has uh, worked with for some of my patients for facilitating movement. Of course, durable medical equipment. I do a lot of suggestions, at, you know, as they're growing older, their pediatric stuff is worn out. So we're always suggesting these custom rolling commode shower wheelchair systems with tilts and headrest and flip back armrests and chest belts. Uh, you know, new products makes a wonderful product, Shower Buddy and Invacare. Uh, and again, I apologize to my colleagues who are around the world and you probably have different vendors and uh, manufacturers. Um, I'm selfishly talking about my folks here in the California uh, US area. Uh, rolling shower chairs, I have my patients like to travel and access their you know, community and do great things. So Go Mobility is a wonderful travel chair for bathing. And um, of course, when my uh, folks are trying to remodel their home environment, we always talk about that seamless roll and shower stall. So I talk a lot about home management and environmental modifications with my patients and their hired caregivers. Uh, all my patients are in lifts, lift systems, because hired caregivers don't want to, you know, you have to protect their backs. And so between Hoyer lifts, Mo lift, Lyco, Rift and lifts, uh, and always using a high back split leg sling versus the solid sling. So you can reduce that amount of shear uh, when they're when you're taking the sling out from under them, um, when they're in their power chair, various things. So we're always very careful about protecting their skin. And there, a lot of my patients have the overhead lifts, with, which are called Shore Hands or Goldman's. And then there is a Voyager portable ceiling lift, which some insurances will cover. And that is a beautiful structure that you can even disassemble and take it with you. So if you wanted to do a bed and you know, at Airbnb, you could take your portable ceiling lift and transport your uh, your individual to and from power chair to uh, of the bed, and it's a really great tool. 
complex rehab technology, I could probably spend a whole day talking about it. I have listed the major features of the complex, uh, the group three power wheelchair. Uh, so that's the tilt and recline, power center mount, power seat elevator. And then the adult side, power seat elevators are not covered by insurance. And that's always a shocker when my adults are like, what do you mean I can't, it's not covered? I'm like, you have to pay $2,000 out of pocket. Um, there is also a chair that has some lateral rotation offered by Motion Concepts. And some of my patients, my non-sitter patients really benefit from that lateral rotation in a power chair, which is a really wonderful feeling. Uh, always custom pressure relieving cushion systems, which I'll show on the next page. Um, supports and harnesses, always padded. Armrests are custom. Uh, options for bilateral elbow stops to prevent arms from falling off the chair. And of course the alternate controls, as Kim mentioned, the mini joysticks uh, for finger and chin, micro light switches, proximity switches, fiber optics, EMG switches, all these things were um, I'm constantly specking and writing justifications and letters of medical necessity. Um, and uh, I'm gonna switch over. So just that middle one here, this power seat elevator is the one I was mentioning is on the adult side is not covered by insurance. So if you can get that on their chair before they come over, that's great. Otherwise it is an add on. Oops, <laughs> this is, um, let me just, fly through here. These are some of the custom molds. Um, so this is, for example, like a ride, a, a ride design system. And this is what it looks like. Uh, uh, this one over here is not actually a patient with SMA, the one in the upper right hand corner. It was a patient with a, a muscular dystrophy, but it was pin dot. And so just, you know, those are other forms. So and here's a list of all the custom um, pressure relieving cushion systems. Basically, it depends on how how adept your vendor is at providing the support you need. So I, you know, I'm I can do ride and I can work with them in foam in place, but it's the vendor who's having that regular long term relationship with our patients. And if they're really good at ride or they're really good at foam in place, then that's pretty much the system you go with because uh, they need adjustments and it's really important to be comfortable and reduce that risk of pressure ulcers. Of course, all my uh, non-sitters are using alternate controls between, uh, you know, mini joysticks and fiber optics, uh, you know, even potentially um, the, uh, the other, you know, the micro light switches. These are all things that we're specking for our patients on their chairs and how they access their job. Uh, here's an example. Um, this is a direct connect lightning fast dual switch interface suitable for everyday access, but can fly with the fastest gamer because a lot of my patients are gamers or they run blogs and they do these amazing things or they're making movies or they're stand up comedians. And so they want to access their iPads and iPhones. And um, so this is a really great way to tap in. Uh, so you can see it's just this adapter here with this adapter and your, your um, micro light. And so they can access um, you know, their computer that way, which is really helpful. Uh, I have patients, um, I have to write letters of accommodation for higher education and meaningful occupation, um, access to dorms, access to their work environment. Um, we can connect individuals to the California Department of Rehabilitation, which will facilitate these individuals to connect with employers who understand their uh, requirement for maybe less hours of work per week. And this, is, this has been a wonderful partnership. And um, of course, community service providing food delivery and access um, to medicine via telehealth. I've done a lot of telehealth visits. And so that's, you know, really been uh, during times of COVID been fantastic and extremely helpful for me writing all these wheelchair modifications um, lately. Adaptive tools, if able, uh, of course, we always suggest whether it's Dyson on various things or universal cuffs, uh, adaptive straws, assistive technology to access home environments. We talk a lot about that with our, my patients and caregivers whether you're using Bluetooth, infrared, or the app-based um, you know, home connection services, it's a big part of my time with my patients. And some of our local resources are uh, is abilitytools.org, which is um, a, a way to access the assistive technology and the device lending library. Uh, and a lot of my patients are very active with the Independent Living Center, which allows them to connect with other individuals with disability. and, um, and 
the vendors I tend to use are National Seating and Mobility, Access Medical, New Motion, and Premier Medical. And two of those are uh, large corporations that are all over the United States. Um, but I have a very uh, good working relationship with all my vendors so that my patients can get everything they need. Um, and that was it. I hope I did it in time. I went as fast as I could. <laughs> you were just about maybe one to two minutes over, but okay. um, I, actually, I actually learned that the plenary session went over. So my apologies that we shouldn't really have started without the other folks finishing all the way. But, um, you know, well, now we have a lot more time for Q&A and I just posted um, um, a That's reminder special. for attendees to rate the session uh, for feedback and for future um, improvement. And so we do have a breakout, um, a social hour later um, scheduled for I think 1130 or so. Um, but since the other sessions will be running a little over, um, you folks are welcome to um, go to that session after our Q&A, which starts about now. So if you have um, in the audience, if you have any questions for the speaker, please go ahead and um, put them into the Q&A um, box in your Whova app and they'll be happy to answer them. So it looks like there's one question. Uh, yes, my PowerPoint will be uploaded uh, for everyone to have access to the slides. And if anyone wants us to go back and cover something that we flew through, we're a little more, more time. than happy to do that. We have plenty of time. I was speed talking through. Um, oh, build a switch. Okay, that's turning that over to you, Kim. It says, could you talk okay. a bit more on how to build a switch? And can we discuss more about the switch that was made? Yes. Uh, so, well, I can discuss with it as much as I know about it. Uh, clearly, with not being able to really work the Zoom here today, technology is not my strong point. But luckily, um, we have some other great OTs here uh, where it is their specialty. And like I said, we do have one OT. He was the MacGyver that got the piece of the file folder together with um, some copper and a USB wire that was split. Uh, what I can do is also upload that document that he made. It shows all the supplies like I had in that last slide. And it's also, I think, a 12 step, uh, step by step on how you can do it yourself. And then it's also been given to families so that they're able to do, um, do it at home themselves too. So uh, hopefully that's helpful. Someone made a comment. I have been wanting to start recommending mobile arm supports. I think they meant to say, but don't. So, uh, is there a specific age? Yeah, I'm um, not sure. Yeah, is there an age? Is? Yeah. It says one new reply. And I, we appreciate your uh, patience with our accessing the Whova app. Right. <laughs> it says, oops, hit enter. I don't know where to start. Okay. Yeah, maybe if you could identify the age. Um, group you work with, Danny Forrest. And I think too, just in making the, the decision in uh, what mobile arm support you want to use or if you want to use it or not, uh, you can simply just, uh, like in some of the videos we showed, just get the patient in a position of gravity eliminated and try uh, to support yourself and see how much active movement they have. So you just try to simulate as much as you can because uh, there are different varieties. You can go as simple as like the slings and springs where it's like an overhead suspension all the way up to um, like a, a full on technical arm or we also use um, the REC system, the Wilmington robotic uh, exoskeleton that uses uh, rubber bands to help, uh, rubber band suspension to help uh, suspend the arm and uh, so they're, they're able to use their shoulder um, and elbow movement uh, for function. 
but I think uh, the, it's a wide it's a wide variety answer um, mm -hmm. to not really knowing what uh, the age of the patient is or maybe uh, how severe their deficits are. And I can just say until we get another question on the adult side, um, I have some patients who oh there's more questions coming in, patients who. Um, have used the neater and some of these um, magnificent mobile arm supports that are powered are not covered by insurance, um, but there are some fantastic tools out there. And the Canova robotic arm has also been used by my patients to actually pick up their arm and provide their own adult range of motion. Um, so that's been a wonderful addition. Um, Kim, do you have any specific contraption that can be used over an adaptive stroller or wheelchair? Uh, so that I don't know if you saw in the video, but um, a lot, a lot of the parents, the one, the drying rack that has the adjustable height, uh, the it can be just wheeled right over um, any kind of device that you have. Um, uh, a lot of times too, you saw this length of spring it had the Theraband component and the soft strap. What I typically will do will also use. Um, like a splint strapping material and have uh, Velcro on it. So I can make, uh, uh, I can lengthen or shorten um, that, that piece of it to, depending on the distance from where the slings and springs starts to where the patient um, is, if that kind of makes sense. We've also used um, our, we have the ability in our sensory gym to use a, um, the trapeze swing. Uh, so we have the swing that hangs down, we put the trapeze swing on, or we just hang a hanger right from the clip of the swing and then hang the slings and springs right from there. And sometimes the patients can just be easily uh, positioned under there too. Um, there's another question. Have you seen any success using K-tape? I use kinesio tape in my other clinic for my, all my other patients. I've never used kinesio tape on my adult population. I'm not sure, Kim, if you used kinesio tape with your pediatric So I, I've tried it with some of uh, the, the um, non-sitter population. I can say I haven't had much success just because they're um, so weak. Um, but I do think, you know, like as we talked about with the change of, you know, like earlier diagnoses and drug treatments, that might be something that we start to use. Uh, and Tim Estelo, uh, my coworker that is also an OT at, at CHOP, he will talk more to this uh, in the next um, uh, sitting population where uh, K-tape is used to help facilitate active movement. And do you have any experience getting something like a Rex for patients, the Rex mobile <laughs> arm support? Uh, I don't, Julie, do you have experience with this? I, I have done Rex training. Most of my patients prefer to go either like the neater arms or the robotic route. So they have not wanted it okay. for my SMA, my patients with SMA at least. Yeah, Tim and I um, have brought in a, a, a bunch of our patients and done uh, fittings of the Rex. Uh, we have used the Copum to, uh, you know, like with and without the Rex to determine um, its, its functional use. Uh, the patient's able to see that it works well with, with them. Uh, we write up these really detailed letters of medical necessity and oftentimes will get denied and then denied with the phone calls later. Yeah. Um, so luckily though, in our clinic, we work with a great uh, social worker. So she finds tons of different grants that um, is able to, uh, we've able to purchase the RECs uh, through all of those grants that she's been able to find. So. We're definitely lucky uh, in that way. And we typically will ask the patients who no longer use their RECs um, to donate it back to the hospital. So then we can give them back out to other patients too. Um, and I think this is important for, especially this uh, SMA1 and SMA2 populations, um, just to uh, be able to use the device, not only for function, but also for exercise. Um, or exactly. range of motion. So like if you load the device with the rubber band system, you can get the patient in uh, shoulder, shoulder flexion um, and get that stretch and then have them work on either bringing it back down or in the side to side motion, the same way that you would use the slings and springs for exercise too. Mm -hmm. Hopefully that helps. 
I don't see any new questions coming through. Let me just double check. And oh, we'll speak to, oh, Tim commented, did you, he will speak to this tomorrow. I think you already mentioned that. Yes. Oh, sorry. yes. Okay, good. Yeah, he mentioned that. Hi, it's, it's Tim. I'm just chiming in briefly. So I, I can speak, good to talk to you. Um, I, I would definitely speak more to this uh, tomorrow briefly uh, within the talk. And, and then afterwards in Q&A, we can get into more particulars if the questions weren't answered. Uh, it, you know, in terms of the RECs and evaluation, it really is something that, you know, we're lucky that we have a couple of them on site and we can trial with, with the patient. You know, the biggest difference with kids with SMA compared to other neuromuscular disorders is the disparity between uh, bicep and triceps weakness. So our, our kids with, with SMA, you, you know, really have considerably more strength in the biceps uh, than do with the triceps. And, and the way the Rex is designed is to provide assistance for elevation of the arm. So at the shoulder and at the elbow. So what the bands are uh, made to do is to assist elbow flexion. So sometimes this isn't the primary need for kids with SMA. And once you add the bands to help with assisting the elbow to flex, what you're doing is then making it harder for the arm to extend back down. So sometimes you have to kind of rig it where you kind of reverse wrap the bands to kind of, you know, almost assist with elbow extension. Uh, or sometimes what we'll do is we'll actually use the bands to lock the elbow into extension so that they can't move um, at the elbow joint, but really let them isolate, isolate the shoulder and you use the deltoid and use the pecs to move the whole arm in space and then utilize the distal hand. So it really depends on what the task is that they're trying to use it for. And then you can, you know, make the adjustment and change the setting based on that task. Uh, that, that's something that, you know, we're, I'm happy to help with offline. If you have patients that you're going to trial with, um, but, but the biggest thing is identifying what's the task they want to use it for and then how, how you're going to kind of set it, how you're, how you're going to set the recs and the band and the tension, uh, you know, to maximize function in that, in that particular task. Um, you know, we've stayed specifically with the rest, with the recs because uh, of the price point. Honestly, it's very hard to even get the recs paid for by most insurance companies. You know, they, they put the term robotic in, in the name, which uh, I think was a mistake because oh, there's right. lots of insurance companies that, you know, just flat out say, you know, robotics aren't, um, you know, proven. These are exploratory. They just flat out deny it. So, you know, we haven't went after any truly robotic power devices because, you know, they're like five, 10, 15 fold cost on some of these. Um, so we, we've stayed to the lower you know, the lower tech um, of a rubber band driven Rex. We, we've tried to get creative over the years and, and leave the name out of it and talk about, uh, you know, body powered or rubber band powered uh, uh, humeral forearm orthoses. And, you know, we, we, we try to get tricky with it and change the names, but eventually they catch on. Uh, so if they're going to approve it, they'll approve it. If they're going to deny it, they'll deny it. They'll deny it. You know, the best thing is kind of like Kim said is, you know, work with your social worker or your local charities to potentially identify some funding sources. But definitely something Kim and I are happy to speak more uh, offline. Uh, we've done Zoom calls and FaceTimes and, and other things with, with community therapists or with patients working and parents just staying at home because, you know, it does need, uh, it does take some time and some expertise. So happy mm -hmm. to talk more about that. Uh, and then also I'll touch base tomorrow on K-Tape, uh, which I think lends itself in the other two populations a little more than it does in this classic, you know, type one non-sitter phenotype. Thanks, Tim. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you, Tim. That was helpful. So it looks like it's 1106, Dong, uh, are we? So I am just updating, um, I am just updating the chat box for the attendees. And because the plenary session went a little over, our social hour that was supposed to start at 
11 has now been pushed closer to 1120. Uh, we want to wait. We want to wait for those folks to come out so that everybody can have a chance to mingle and chat and network. Um, and we thank you so much for your patience in um, helping to answer all these questions and um, being with us here for the session. We are now at 1106. So we've probably got a, about 14 minutes of wait time. If anybody else has any questions for the speakers or have any other questions in general. So, so I have a question uh, slash comment. So, uh, unfortunately, I didn't realize that uh, this was a hard start time, and and joined, you know, joined after the plenary talks were done. So, I, I came on to Kim's talk uh, probably about halfway through her second case series and missed you know, you know the entire beginning. So, I'm curious: is is there a way to vote and kind of see how many people that are on the call now did the same thing? I mean, if, if there's only a few of us that missed the beginning, I think that's okay. If there's a lot of people that missed, you know, the first three quarters of her talk, it may be good while we have time for Kim to kind of run through that again. So is there a mechanism to kind of see, am I the only sucker that took too long to get on or did everybody else hop off of the plenary? And uh, Are the sessions recorded again? too? Or, I mean, I'd be happy to go over it again, but. Yes. Um, all the questions are recorded and this is actually um, my apologies because I have been communicating with the other um, organizers and they informed me that the plenary session went over and I, sh I should have waited for um, the session to go to be over before starting this one. But I did take note that we had about 17 people um, in the work in this breakout session before I, we had start. So I would say that was more than half of whoever registered for this breakout session, but it is recorded. Um, but I know we have about 13, uh, 13 or so minutes left. Um, if, if Kim, um, you don't mind uh, speaking to a few key points of your um, of your presentation for Tim, that might help him since he's presenting. Um, yeah, so I'm I'm I'm, I'm, I'm very familiar with. Uh, you know, Kim's presentation, we work together. I, I just didn't <laughs> no, know how I didn't, many. I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm sorry. I, I, I buried the lead there. You, you know, my thing is I really wanted, Kim does a lot of excellent stuff in the pool with aquatics. And I think this is a, a thing that really needs to be covered and people are always asking for exposure to it and information. So again, if I'm one of the few that missed it, I think that's fine. I certainly know the wonderful work that Kim does, but it, if there's a, people who are still on here who missed you know, miss that beginning and miss, miss those aquatic slides. I, I think that would be a great area for Kim to kind of show the videos again and, and discuss a little bit for that group. So again, I'm not sure if there's a way. I see that there's like a thing that says votes when there's a question there. I don't know if somebody can pose the question, do people want to see more aquatics and see what the response is? But, um, you know, we do still have some time left. And if that's oh. something people would find valuable, it would be good to. I, I do have a quick question. Show more of that. Um, if, if we could just um, address this one thing, I've been looking for information about splinting and positioning and the majority of stuff that I find says that it doesn't work. What research do you have that you point people to when they say that it doesn't work or what evidence do you have, you know, that can support that? So I think um, what we just refer back to um, the standards of care and all of those um, references are uh, within the documents that are posted. Um, I think it depends on, you know, like how well they're able to follow through with the stretching program, uh, when you start the bracing, how weak the patient is, um, how they're positioned throughout the day. Uh, there's many different factors that I think uh, go into it. Um, so I think it's hard to kind of say, you know, like this, this is why they're continuing to have contractures, if that kind of makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does. I, I think to add to that, if I can, uh, you know, there, there really isn't research. And, and if you think historically, um, and if you think, you know, contextually at looking at the patient as a whole, and historically you're talking about, you know, non-sitters phenotype as being SMA type one. So when you have, a, I don't remember the percentage offhand, but say 40% or 50% that die within the first year and a larger percent that die within two years, you know, ventilation, quality of life, um, you know, time with the children is really the parent's priority. And in, in the scheme of things, you know, an elbow flexion contracture or wrist contracture or finger contractures, you know, these things, when you're talking about life or death, um, you know, respiratory support, kids on ventilators, it's it's very hard to gain 
uh, you know, to bring light to that and, and kind of shine the importance of that, you know, and also historically, there was no, there was no function kind of to be gained or regained or, or quite often, honestly, function to begin with. So it's very hard to convince somebody who has a child that's on a respirator, who's in a special mattress, who may not even be able to sit up, you know, because they, they don't have the, the pulmonary respiratory function to, to allow that to then put on hand splints or put on feet splints. So I think, you know, to, to get this population, this sample that's willing to splint, and then, you know, even to find a way to kind of measure that and quantify it, uh, you know, is very hard. Uh, is very hard to do. So I think when the question's asked, the answer is, you know, no, there's no research in this population. Um, however, you can look at other neuromuscular populations and you can look at other phenotypes in, in SMA um, where they do serial casting in the lower extremity for the ambulators and show, you know, shows progress and results. Um, and they use HCOFOs to, you know, in standards to keep in PT to keep kids uh, standing and weight bearing and up and, and prevent contractures. And then there's also, um, there's a lower extremity paper that was done from the uh, PNCR research group that looked at the impact of uh, contractures on uh, lower extremity and gross motor function. And, and there's cut points that show thresholds of when you have a knee or hip flexion contracture of X or Y degrees, that's a cut point that differentiates between, you know, the top 25% of performers on, uh, I believe it was the Hammersmith that they used, uh, um, or or the lower or the lower twenty fifth percentile. So th there's certainly literature that shows in, in the lower extremity, and then uh, Kim and I are working on a similar project in the upper extremity now, where we looked at strength and contracture related to upper extremity function as measured by the Rome, with the hopes of identifying these kind of thresholds or potential thresholds, so that you know with the patient population you can make the the argument that we know that passive range of motion is related to function. Uh, we know that patients that have contractures of greater than X degrees perform worse on these functional assessments. And these are the things that we kind of use as guidance. And, and now that we're in the treatment-based area era, uh, you know, these kids are changing as you, as you saw from, as you may have seen from the talk this morning, if, you think, if, if you're still on it, um, that the phenotype's evolving. And, you know, now we have a moving baseline that I think it's, it's more important than ever that us as therapists start to really have these discussions on, you know, we need to prevent this contracture in the limb. We don't know to what degree they're going to have, you know, axonal recovery to what degree this muscle waste that they had before or may not, may not have had yet if they're early, you know, how much muscle um, hypertrophy they're going to have. And, and we're unsure of how much, how much growth and development is going to occur. So, you know, we want to prevent these secondary contractures from impeding potential future progress. So, so that's the angle I would take with the family. Uh, now, it'll, again, it has to be looked at kind of in the whole plan of care because they come in the multidisciplinary clinic. And, you know, as OTs, we have our recommendations that are very important to us. And the PT has their recommendations and the dietitian and possibly the speech therapist and, and the physician and social worker. So I, I think as a team, it's really about kind of identifying what are each of our priorities and how, what's the hierarchy and how they go. Um, and advocating for the hands because, you know, we all know the hands don't get as much love as the feet. Uh, everybody wants the kids to walk. You know, I always joke and say, it's great if you walk, but if you get there and you can't use your hands, you, you know, you're kind of stuck. So uh, I, I rambled on for a while now. Hopefully some of that made sense. And uh, if not, hopefully I clarify more of that tomorrow. Thanks, Tim.